Uh, after listening to that fantastically moving piece, I'd like to dedicate this reading to the emergency team at the Manchester Children's Hospital who saved my granddaughter on Tuesday when she had an asthma attack. When she couldn't breathe for herself, they breathed for her. And that's compassion. So sad that Alice Oswald couldn't be here. Um, it's, it's all about climate change. Um, this is a poem which you'll have to rearrange some of the geographical details a little bit. <clears throat> but I think it connects. It's called Lighting the First Fire of Autumn. Here they are, the quartered logs in their wicker basket, woven of what I take to be birch and split willow plaited together. The copse offering itself for the burning indoors, twig against twig, tree within tree. Rough cut block capitals of an alphabet older than writing. Poplar, beech, pine, chainsawed joints of the wood, bled and dried out for a year, lodged in the season's calendar. Their rituals subordinate now to mine as I build the pyre of oak twigs and newsprint in the middle of the year's first cold morning. The TV news shows tropical forests on fire, drought in East England and the Midlands flooded a crude mosaic of weather that looks like a warning. Saint Columkill said he feared death and hell, but worse, the sound of an axe in a sacred grove. Now every grove is sacred, and still we burn wood at times, for the fire also is sacred, and a house without it, like a heart without love, when the world heads into darkness. The heat's core will show you again lost faces and glittering forests, mountain passes, caverns, an archetypal world recited in the twinkling of a dark pupil. The epic buried inside us never rests. Fire is the dark secret of the forest. The green crowns drink sunlight until their dumb hearts are glutted with fire, then decaying or burning, give up, give up whatever they have. A match flares and the paper ignites. Watch and the poems will come. This is a, a poem about being alone at night in a room. Um, it was written in the Duddon Valley, um, where things can seem very, very peaceful, lonely, isolated at night. It's called Cosmos. Between Orion and Gemini, an almost full moon. Wrinkled tide water tilting at the lips of Morecambe Bay. Galaxies of cow parsley edging the valley fields. Slow explosions of lichen on the fell side boulders. The long armed yew gesticulating at your window. Ancient growth rings cupping a still more ancient hollow. Old glass, molten, tremulous, lungful of human breath, spun flat, cut to rippled squares, set in the dusty casement. Grain of the living oak stopped dead in your tabletop. Cobweb at the table's corner, a map of skewed coordinates. Your table lamp fed by Hesham's uranium rods. Havrig's twinkling wind farm, <coughs> buried cables along the Duddon Valley. Your mobile, lit menu, notional time, no signal. The mountain against the black of the sky, a blacker black. The toy town labyrinth of your fingerprint 
Chartres' maze stretched to an oval. The field paths crisscrossing in the palm of your hand. An ink slick spreading in the pen's furrow. Gold keel plowing an ocean of churned Norway spruce. All of it drawn and drawn into the pupil's black hole. The dark that cannot be seen. The space that is everything else. Since Alice Oswald can't be here, I thought it would be nice to read one of her poems. Um, this is Pruning in Frost. We haven't really had frost this winter, have we? We've just had rain and rain and rain. This is to remind us what frost is like. Pruning in Frost. Last night, without a sound, a ghost of a world lay down on a world. Trees like dream wrecks corralled with increments of frost. Found crevices and wound and wound the clock spring cobwebs. All life's ribbon frozen mid fling. Oh, I am stone thumbs, feet of glass. Work knocks in me the winter's nail. I can imagine pain turned heaven could fly off slowly in a creak of wings. And I'd be staring like one of those cold, holy and granite kings getting carved into this effigy of orchard. Thank you, Alice Oswald. Um, maybe this might be a point to connect back to the death theme once more. We've, we've had a mention of Buddhism. Um, at Palonarua in Sri Lanka, there is a colossal statue of the Buddha lying down, and it's supposed to show the Buddha at the moment of his passing away at the end of his life. So this is recumbent Buddha at Polonorua. A grain like marbling or like watered silk flows without movement through the sleeping face. Rock ripples tinged with rose and ash and milk. Known tastes of being calmed find their place. It is as though the rock itself had slept to dream this shape. The eyelids curve, the lip smoother than any natural form except maybe the moon's rim or the water drop. Or as if we had sought a word to speak out of our nature, suffering, changeable, empty, and found at last simply this cheek relaxing on clasped hands and this half smile that flowers for more than a child's unblemished seeing or a god's detachment. Massive, lightly creased, the carved silk pillows a wholly human being whose last breath has perhaps this moment ceased. Um, where shall we go? Let's have a cheerful poem. Things are, things are a little bit, little bit serious, aren't they? Um, this is, in one sense, a poem about gardening. I spent ages trying to get those yellow Welsh poppies to grow in my garden, and for some reason couldn't do it. And then, of course, when I stopped trying, they happened. So this is the Welsh poppy. Could be a poem about love, or even sex, possibly. We'll see. The Welsh poppy. Forgotten desires fulfilled are the best kind. Her yellow silks uncrumpled by the wind. Out of their furred green case, the Welsh poppy now, unplanned, unasked, displays 
and unrelated to how some years I scattered seed in a different bed, dug in roots, scrutinized, but nothing happened. Over starry leaves, green springs unfurl from weed-like beginnings in unpromising soil. Perhaps there's hope. It may be happiness. Once you have given up, hope will come like this. Um, okay, I'm going to um, take a little journey now. Um, this is a poem from Cuba, um, where I went to to learn dance. Um, this is about um, this is about going going for my dance lesson and. How you, uh, how you get let into a, an upper floor apartment in Havana where they don't have lifts or doorbells that work. It's called The Key. This time, the key comes down in a white sock, small enough it looks for a child. Yesterday, it was a twist of paper. The day before, a spectacle case, plastic. That's how you visit in Havana, expected you squat, hoping for shade, on a doorstep across the street to squint up at the flaking, elaborate balconies, blistered shutters, washing bicycles, waiting for the familiar face to appear. Arriving unexpectedly, you stand on the pavement and yell or whistle shrilly with two fingers, if you can, until the same face peers down at you. Then she'll disappear to fetch the key, Return to choose a gap between infrequent cars, motorbikes, rickshaws, and at the best moment, toss it down, wrapped in something soft and conspicuous. You run out like a cricketer to catch it, but never do. It skitters on the warm air, pirouettes sideways. Now you will always miss, it plunges to the dust, while she leans over to watch you pick it up and stroll to the cracked, sun-pitted street door. Turning the key this moment, I step through and shut myself in the cool, musty dark by the electric water pump and the black serpent coil of cables writhing from the rusty fuse box. I stand to breathe a moment, then start up the twisting marble stairs, climb the five flights. She will be waiting by the stairhead to kiss, como estas? and take the key, then slam and bolt the door, slip off her trainers, choose a CD. Now we shall dance and dance. And this is, uh, this is a Manchester poem, but it has a connection with the previous one because it's about a little bit of Cuba in Manchester. One of my favorite places is the Cuba Cafe in the Northern Quarter, which is full of Caribbean memorabilia. And uh, it's like a little, a little bit of Cuba in Manchester. So this is Cuba Cafe. Moe's Cafe has a bicycle hanging from the roof. Also, white roses, a child's scooter, cabin trunks, and a downset portable record player. Guitars, books, a rifle, old 78s, and racks of wine up there are all perfectly normal, as are the plastic palms and the great sweeping ceiling fans that sail over your head while you admire photographs of Castro, Marilyn Monroe, Charlie Parker, and the Rat Pack or watch the grainy videos of Tito Puente on one of the six TV screens among the strings of flashing lights and the shadows in the mirrors, finishing your soul or corona. And here's Mo with his gold earring and towel beginning another supercharged salsa class. Keep up or you go to the wall, glistening with heat from the dance, the old pipework and the rough brick. 
Drawn up on the pavement is his classic car, not a Dodge or Plymouth, but the 1956 Vauxhall Cresta he calls Lolita, her paintwork all gleaming burgundy and gray, polished to such a mirror sheen that when you step out into the Manchester weather, just the sight of her in the gold light from the cafe is enough to make you smile. It's on Port Street, so do go and have a look at it sometime. It's worth seeing. I forgot to check the time when I came up. How are we doing? Does anybody know? How, how much longer? A couple more minutes, OK. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, going back in time a little bit, um, this is a poem that came out of a couple of lines in the Anglo-Saxon poem about the Battle of Malden, um, which was fought in 991 AD. Um, a bunch of English, Saxon, anyway, Anglo-Saxon warriors went to um, fight off some Danes, and they didn't come back. Um, the, one of the Saxon nobles has a hawk, a falcon, on his fist. And before going into the battle, um, it was the custom to set the hawk off, send it away. If you lived, you would call it back afterwards. Um, this is the, the hawk's point of view, and the, the poem has these two lines, um, and it says, He let him that of handon, leof ne fleuran, hafok with das halters, and to var hilda stop, which means he let go then from his hand, his beloved falcon, to fly to the woodland, and he strode to the battle. This is the hawk's point of view. The Malden hawk. And so, dismissed, I rose on a wing beat over horses already scattering to the wood, unwanted as men turned to their war. Vassal set loose from his master's service. Blameless outlaw freed to the houseless wild. Circling, I watched thickets of metal and leather crowd the shallows of the deepening tide. Now, as I scour the air, my heart divides between longing for the man's call and the wideness of the world, where I got honor by my end game pleasing nobles in the hour when the bright dove fled the man-flung hawk. I pivot at flight's apex, but will not return, though my jeweled eye sees each ring on his corslet catch sun as he merges into the mass, death besotted warriors on their way to darkness. Gladly I would stoop a last time into his language, but already battle's whirlpool sucks him in, his face downward, nameless and eyeless among the iron helmets. I am a word forgotten from his story. He is a landmark fading from my sight. Men had seemed to have some special knowledge. Now the sea wind tastes of death, they rush towards it, whether to sing with saints, or feast with battle fellows, or lie at a tree's root until the world ends, they know no better than I. Never again, child of the waste moor and the tufted woodland, will I perch on that wrist, grasp the bone beneath. I'm going to finish with a poem which I never thought I would have the chance to read in this particular room, because it's about something that happened in this particular room. Um, and hoping for something that might happen here as well. <clears throat> um, it's written in the rather doggerel form known as Skeltonics, after um, John Skelton, Tudor poet. It's called Exorcism. Now I remember. It was late November. Up in the gallery of the old library, 
books and papers stacked away, I was finished for the day. All afternoon long, not once had a clang of the metal gate to the stair stuck upon my ear. Yet when I passed the last bay, the corner of my eye glimpsed, surely, someone bent over the desk, intent on a book. I stopped, stepped back. No one. I shrugged, walked on. Then, in July, an exhibition, a party. What is this book cathedral like as a place of work? I asked a group of staff. A general laugh. Predictable answers for most. One murmured, except for the ghost, gesturing at last bay, up in the gallery. Alert now, I pressed and soon heard the rest, the trainee in the stack who felt eyes on her back, talk among the porters of someone who loiters just out of sight beyond the stairs at night, slammed doors after hours, cold air shivers. Unquiet spirit, if you read this poem or hear it, look up and know, now your time to go. No longer search double columns in calf-bound volumes of incunabula to fill the tabula rasa of your soul. Cease now, be whole. Let the long past whisper to rest. Let all the uncertain future become an empty mirror. Go now, have peace unbroken, clear as the unspoken silence, perfect as the white space after this poem is. Thank you.